There is only one time when history is not historic, and that is when it is being made. It happened in broad daylight on the campus of Kent State University in Ohio during a protest rally against the Vietnam War. In a shocking 13-second burst of gunfire, members of the Ohio National Guard killed four unarmed college students and wounded nine others. It is an event preserved in time, thanks to a wealth of raw, tangible evidence. Students now across the commons are throwing insults. They're yelling murderer. You may think you know what happened, but the reality lies on the edges of history. To find it, we will look at the different elements in a fresh light, including the emotional account of an indicted National Guardsman who has agreed to his first television interview. This is the story of a day that rocked America to its core. This is Kent State, from uprising to occupation. How it happened. How it looked. How it was. The facts are these. On Monday, May 4th, 1970, Several thousand students at Kent State gathered near the center of campus. A rally had been called to protest the expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia. Similar rallies were taking place at other colleges across the country. The Kent State gathering, however, was in defiance of an official ban on campus protests. The National Guard was there to enforce the ban and to keep order after a weekend of sporadic violence and vandalism. Tensions were running high. Still no one on either side expected bloodshed. Even after so many years, the sights and sounds of that afternoon bristle with unexpected immediacy. This footage was shot around noon on Monday as about 100 National Guardsmen broke up the scheduled rally in a part of campus known as the Commons. At around 12.25 p.m., hundreds of students are watching when the guardsmen near the top of a rise called Blanket Hill. A handful of students throw stones. As the troops crest the hill, some of them turn back. First a few, then several more. There's a gunshot, perhaps two followed immediately by a barrage. There were people hiding, trying to hide behind a curb. If you could dig a hole that fast, you would have, you know, when you realized you were being shot at. Some of the guardsmen shoot into the air, some towards the ground, but at least eight fire at students. In just over 13 seconds, an estimated 60 rounds of live ammunition are discharged. I could hear the bullets hitting the ground around me, and I'm thinking, why are they shooting at me? Oh my God, this is crazy. And it seemed like it went on forever, and then all of a sudden I got hit. I could feel that my leg was numb, and I sat up to try to look down at, at my wound, and then I heard someone yelling, stay down, stay down. I was struck with a bullet that hit me in the abdomen, and uh, seems like it blew me through the air, and I landed on the ground. It's like getting hit in the chest with a sledgehammer. I mean, just suddenly this thing just slammed into my chest. And then uh, I dropped right near that metal sculpture. And that's pretty much the last I remember. As the gun smoke clears, the guardsmen turn and march back through the commons. Left behind are the shell-shocked, 
the wounded, and the dead. Jeffrey Miller, Alison Krauss, Sandra Scheuer, and William Schroeder. Schroeder and Scheuer were not part of the protest. They were simply on their way to class. On the right side of this frame is a 14-year-old runaway named Marianne Vecchio. She was one of the first to reach Jeffrey Miller. There was so much blood, I knew he was dead. There was no movement, he was just there, laying in that street, just horrifying. John Philo, a senior journalism major, was photographing the chaos of the aftermath. I remember people shouting at me, what kind of pig am I taking these pictures and everything? And I, you know, it just, at some point it just became this detachment. You know, you could hear people screaming in your ear and screaming at you, but you know, you sort of knew what you had to shoot. At that moment, the fates of John Philo and Marianne Vecchio crossed in this historic photo. I just, um, I, you know, wanted to help, but there was nothing to do, and I just, just was screaming. She just sort of lets out with a scream, you know, and, and, and it was, and it was an automatic picture. It's an image that captures the essence of an unthinkable horror. American soldiers had shot American students on American soil. Well, my response to the shooting in Kent was uh, simply the fact that uh, the people weren't uh, behaving properly and apparently they have asked for that sort of thing. Some residents in the town of Kent blamed the students for the conflict. These interviews were conducted shortly after the shootings by Kent State Professor Richard Meyer. What do you think about the shooting at Kent? Do you think it was justified? Yes, I do. I'm sorry they didn't kill more. Really? Really, sir. More, more of the students? Yes, because they, they were warned and they knew what was happening and they should have moved out. On many campuses, the shootings touched off an unprecedented wave of dissent. Demonstrations broke out at more than 1,300 colleges nationwide. Ten days after Kent State, Jackson State University in Mississippi was stunned when two students were killed by police as protests over the Kent State shootings spun out of control. Within a week, more than 500 colleges and universities had been shut down by the largest student strike in American history. The country was being torn in two, and Kent State stood at the center of the chasm. Hey John, I was working. You didn't do anything. Why don't you kill people more often? You're good at it. Today, despite two civil trials, a criminal trial, a state grand jury, and a presidential commission, questions remain. Every guardsman up there was hit by rocks. By five, ten people, not more. The men that did do the firing were, I believe, their lives were in jeopardy. They did not shoot any warning shots in the air. Like Untold hours of official and unofficial testimony turn into a cacophony of conflicting stories. The photographs and film footage represent our only dispassionate witnesses to the events of that day. The footage you're about to see was shot by a local NBC camera crew positioned behind the National Guard lines. You'll see our video is where we take pictures of the bell and then I grab George by his shoulders when I heard the first shot go off because there's a pause between shots because we were rolling for that entire time and pointed him up the hill when they were shooting. Student photographers captured the key moments surrounding the shooting from a much different perspective. John Darnell took these photos at the moment the firing commenced. The FBI's told me it's something like 1.2 seconds after the shooting began, I started to take these series of three photos. I'm not even so sure I realized they were uh, firing real bullets. Um, I just took my photos. 
These photographs, along with dozens of others taken that day, revealed a bitter truth for the country. The Vietnam War had come home. The growing hostility between supporters and protesters of the war had ignited a firestorm of controversy that continues to this day. After all these years of consideration, I'm convinced of one thing. What we saw on May 4th, 1970, was a 24-minute hunting expedition. After more than 30 years, opinions about Kent State are as sharply drawn as ever. Was there an official order to fire upon the students? Or was the entire affair an unfortunate, tragic accident? Nearly all the guardsmen said there was never an order to fire. Many claimed self-defense. They admit they reacted impulsively, scared the students would overrun them. But critics still contend it was a deliberate, premeditated attempt to shut down student protests. In 2007, Alan Canfora, one of the wounded students, produced what he says is proof the guardsmen were ordered to shoot. His evidence is an audio tape recorded by a student some 80 yards away from the firing. There was a verbal command to fire here at Kent State University. One officer said, right here, get set, point, fire. <laughs> Though the raw tape may sound inconclusive, Canfora is convinced that eventually an analysis of the master recording will prove him right. But one of the guardsmen present that day contends the order to point weapons is highly unlikely. I can't imagine a military man saying point. If there were a command, it would be something like commence firing. The argument over the tape is just the latest battleground in the struggle to understand the Kent State controversy. But without context, there can be no real understanding, because what happened that day didn't happen in a vacuum. The 1960s were about much more than hippies, free love, and rock and roll. The struggle for civil rights and an unpopular war in Southeast Asia became the flashpoints of social, political, and cultural upheaval, spearheaded by the nation's youth. For many Americans, the threat to the status quo was embodied by radical organizations like Students for a Democratic Society. The SDS grew out of the civil rights movement and gathered force with their crusade against the Vietnam War. The group was active on many campuses nationwide, including Kent State. What they're doing is hoping that they can somehow scare us into not being ourselves. It was a student movement that, that suited the, the purpose of the times, which was to empower young people and students at a time when we couldn't vote, completely disenfranchised, but we could be drafted. In 1970, the voting age was 21, yet any male 18 to 25 years old could be drafted and sent to Vietnam. Draft had a large part to do with the anti-war movement. Everyone in high school in 1969 and 70 knew that they were either going to face the draft immediately or after some time in college if they got a 2S deferment. The combination of the draft and an increasingly unpopular war created the perfect breeding ground for unrest. In the heart of the heart of the country, officials at Kent State University and in the city of Kent were trying to hold their own against this tide of social turmoil. Kent was a quiet middle-class college city, proud of its university. For more than six decades, the town welcomed the surge of students that swelled its population each fall. Somebody once said, living in a, a small town with a large college is like sleeping with an elephant. You have to be careful when it rolls over. The university's president, Robert White, suspected that if Kent State's student body decided to roll over, the SDS, or the more militant weathermen, might be involved. The Weathermen was a splinter group of the SDS, pushing for more radical, violent action. FBI documents say that between 1969 and 1971, the group was responsible for at least 14 bombings, mostly directed at government entities. We have gone on the offensive. 
It is we who call the shots now. Just two months before the Kent State shootings, three members of the Weathermen were killed by an accidental bomb blast at their safe house in New York City's Greenwich Village. One of the dead, Terry Robbins, had been an SDS organizer at Kent State in 1968 and 69. Many Kent residents were unnerved. It felt like a revolution was brewing in their own backyard. There were a lot of people that lived in Kent at that time that were very bitter and very angry and scared of the students. We're all scared. When kids come in here and tell me they're going to burn my building down, unless I do what they want me to, then I think it's time we make an issue of it. The fear and anger created by the anti-war movement stretched well beyond Kent's main street, all the way to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. Richard Nixon had been elected president just over 18 months earlier, partly because of his promise to end the war. The year before, Nixon had initiated the bombing of North Vietnamese camps in Cambodia. The action was kept largely secret from the public and most of Congress. But the bombing had limited success in stopping the Vietnamese infiltration. Now the U.S. was preparing to send ground forces into Cambodia, technically a neutral country. Nixon approved the operation in late April 1970. In cooperation with the armed forces of South Vietnam, attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. People were so furious about the invasion of Cambodia, there was a lot of rage. It just seemed to almost represent our worst nightmare. Protesters painted anti-war slogans on storefront walls in downtown Kent. A campus protest rally was called for noon the next day. Little did anyone know it would lead to a weekend of violence that would mark the end of America's innocence. This is not an invasion of Cambodia. Friday, May 1st, the day after Nixon's Cambodia announcement. Over the next four days, Kent State and Kent, Ohio would descend into hell. These photographs show how it was on Friday afternoon. The weekend began with the first on-campus anti-war rally in two weeks. It was sponsored by a group of graduate students in history. They called themselves World Historians Opposed to Racism and Exploitation. So their acronym was HOR, which, you know, I think is kind of emblematic of the times, you know, sort of fun-spirited but serious. Another rally was announced for the next Monday. At 1 o'clock, the students disbanded heading off to their afternoon classes or home for the weekend. I suggest you leave the area. But that night, anti-war protests spilled onto the streets of Kent. This news footage was shot after an angry mob charged down the streets. They smashed windows for several blocks before the police dispersed them. This was something totally new. This was something very threatening to people, and it, it instilled a lot of fear and a lot of the people in and around the Kent community. Saturday was quiet in town as store owners, some aided by student volunteers, cleaned up in the wake of the disturbance. But rumors of more trouble were rampant. We were told by some of the people on campus, some of the students, that at 8 o'clock that building's going up. And uh, that was pretty good information. That building was the campus headquarters of the Army's Reserve Officers Training Corps. Within hours, it would go up in flames. Well, we got a call for assistance because the fire department needed police on campus. And we began to see the glow in the sky from the fire at the ROTC building. The glow in the sky also brought the news cameras to campus. As predicted, the ROTC building was ablaze and the students were determined to see it burn to the ground. Several of the firemen were knocked down by the students, and the students grabbed their hoses, pulled them away. Some people took out knives and cut the hoses, rendering them useless. This police dispatch recording reveals the frustration of both local officials and local residents. Citizens, 
Miss Miller wants another unit up on campus. The kids have cut the hoses to the fire trucks and they are setting fire to the buildings. Look at his tear gas on. Just shoot him. The Kent police came onto campus around the building wearing riot gear. I watched them. They were really nervous. Some of these guys weren't sure what they were getting into. Then I heard this noise, and, and it was a sound of half tracks, and I saw that it was the National Guard coming onto campus. Kent Mayor Leroy Satrum had called the governor for help. The governor had sent the guard. Some of the troops positioned themselves to protect the firemen, but by then, the fire was out of control. Here, we can see how it was the next morning. The symbol of the government's war machine was gone. What remained, however, was the presence of the National Guard. At first, the soldiers were the target of some ridicule. The people that were there were the subject of much joculation, you know. Why are you guarding this building? You know, it was ludicrous. It was burnt to the ground. But they were there stationed guarding it. My orders were to protect the property, and that's what we did. Matthew McManus was one of around 900 National Guardsmen that patrolled the campus. He was among the eight guardsmen later indicted for the shootings. This is his first television interview. Students were amongst us at the time. During the day, some of us were playing touch football with, with some of the, uh, the students. We were playing cards with the students. The guardsmen and the students were just talking to each other. There was this kind of social interaction that was happening on Sunday. And while the vehicles lined up on front campus seemed very disturbing because that was a mass you saw them all in one place, the guardsmen themselves didn't seem threatening. But the atmosphere begins to sour with the arrival of Ohio's governor, James Rhodes. The news cameras document his every move. Rhodes is a popular conservative, nearing the end of his second term in office. That spring, he is fighting for the Republican nomination for the U.S. Senate. With the primary just two days away, Perhaps he sees an opportunity to show voters he's a tough law and order candidate. His comments at a press conference on Sunday inflame the students. This now is the problem of the state of Ohio. I think that we're up against the strongest, well-trained, militant, revolutionary group that has ever assembled in America. We're going to employ every weapon possible. To me, that sort of gave a legitimation to the guard that they could treat students uh, as enemies. Apparently prompted by Rhodes' hardline stance, officials outlaw Monday's scheduled rally. A reporter asked Governor Rhodes on May the 3rd what his definition was of a rally, and he said two students walking together. The easygoing rapport between students and guardsmen transforms as darkness falls. It seemed so casual. At night, it turned ugly, very ugly. Sunday night, students demonstrate in the streets just off campus. Hundreds block traffic by staging a sit-in. As police, National Guard, and state troopers face off against the students, helicopters circle overhead. The guardsmen fire tear gas, then physically herd the students back onto campus. The next day, Monday, May 4th, a rally is to be held in defiance of the ban on campus protests. News crews and dozens of still photographers are there. They sense something is going to happen. Around noon, the bell at the south end of the commons rings. The violence of the preceding days has changed everything. Instead of a few hundred students, thousands show up, many of them just to watch. The students completely surround the commons and a by now exhausted National Guard. Many of the guardsmen have come to Kent straight from another tense deployment. 
The previous week, Rhodes had called in the guard to escort truck convoys and protect trucking terminals when a Teamsters strike threatened to erupt into violence. The situation at Kent State allows no time for rest or recuperation. I was totally tired. I was exhausted. I was on duty until 5 o'clock that morning. My men were on duty until 5 o'clock that morning. But the officers have their orders. The students are to be prevented from demonstrating. Yet at first, the guard does nothing. The guardsmen seem to allow the initial speeches to go on. But somewhere along the line, there came a point where they decided, we're going to you know, put an end to this, and we're going to disperse the students. <laughs> After about 15 minutes, the guard has had enough. And the order came down to lock and load, fix bayonets, and uh, prepare to use gas. Uh, place gas masks on your head. Um, I issued that order to my men. This is the guard's commanding general. Robert Canterbury. He has only recently arrived and is still wearing his business suit. You have your weapons in the ready position. The troops are told to load live ammunition. This is out of the ordinary. Most of the time, soldiers wear their ammunition clips on their uniform, which constitutes a clear show of force. Intimidation is a, is a clip attached to your shirt in, in plain sight, that's intimidation. That's intimidation. When you see that brass on that bullet and the point of that bullet shining in the sunlight, that's intimidation. Lock and load is beyond intimidation. The guardsmen are now prepared for battle, weapons fully loaded with live ammunition. The orders are then given. The Ohio National Guard marches out onto the commons and into history. Just past noon, hundreds of students at Kent State University squared off against a detachment of armed National Guard troops. The protesters were determined to exercise their right to protest against the Vietnam War. To break up the illegal student rally, the guard first used tear gas. But as this film footage shows, a strong wind made the gas canisters no more than playthings for some of the students. It didn't have much impact. In fact, it probably emboldened them some. And uh, they started to throw them back, a few of them. As the tear gas dissipated, around 100 guardsmen were marched out towards the students. Students aren't going to argue with guys with bayonets and guns and bullets. They'll decide, I'm getting out of here. The troops headed up Blanket Hill, pushing the protesters back. In this photograph, one of the protesters is Allison Krauss. She will be killed when the guard opens fire. By now, the rally has been all but dispersed. Yet an officer orders the troops to continue over and down the hill, away from Taylor Hall. They march another 200 yards and find themselves in an awkward, if not dangerous, situation. The guardsmen are now on the practice football field with students in front of them and a fence to the side. I never felt trapped in, in the sense, but there certainly was probably the heaviest barrage of rocks and stuff. We were kind of sitting ducks at that point, but uh, it wasn't that we, we entrapped ourselves or felt that we had done that. Troop discipline begins to splinter. A few guardsmen break ranks to throw tear gas canisters back at the students. At the back of the field, the officers meet to determine their next move. General Canterbury can be seen at the center of the group. 
What I've believed is that down on the practice field, they decided that they would go up to the top of the hill, and when they got there, they would teach these demonstrators a lesson. The following photographs capture the sequence of events. The guardsmen realign and head from the practice field back up Blanket Hill. The students cheer, assuming the maneuver is a retreat. It seemed to embolden them that we were retreating them. And they, they started to close in, yes. They, they started to yell a chant of kill, kill, kill. I can remember that chant. Kill, kill, kill. I'm convinced that if, if the students had decided to rush the guard, they could overrun us. But many believe this photo proves the students hardly posed a serious threat. In just seconds, the guard will turn and fire in the direction of the photographer. The guardsmen were outnumbered, heavily outnumbered, but the students were entirely outgunned. When the troops reach the top of Blanket Hill, all hell breaks loose. When the guardsmen turned and took aim, they were in a small open area next to Taylor Hall. All the shots were fired in a narrow range towards Prentice Hall parking lot. The four dead students, Jeffrey Miller, Allison Krauss, William Schroeder, and Sandra Scheuer, were between 88 and 130 yards away. This grainy 8 millimeter film is the only known footage showing both the actual firing and the reaction of the crowd. The film was taken from a dormitory window several hundred yards away. The guardsmen are barely visible at the top of the hill, though faint puffs of smoke can be seen as the firing commences. Because of the poor quality, the film does nothing to clarify exactly what transpired. Numerous eyewitnesses, however, claim the guardsmen turned in unison. They turned and they were firing. There was no hesitation uh, between, it was almost like this quick movement where they stopped, turned, and fired. The guard turned and it fired towards the group. I saw guys turn in unison, lower their weapons, and start firing. This photograph was taken just before the shooting began. General Canterbury and Lieutenant Colonel Charles Fassinger can be seen behind the firing line. If there wasn't an order to fire or an agreement to fire when they got to a certain location, how do you account for those guys when turning together in unison? Some guard officers claimed they heard a shot. Instinct took over. That was why the troops turned around and opened fire. That sound I heard, and I characterized only it was different. Could it have been a shot? Absolutely. I don't know where the shot came from. All I know is I looked the same way the troops did. Suspicion regarding this first shot soon fell on two different men. This guardsman is Sergeant Myron Pryor. He appears to be firing a 45 caliber handgun. I could see the shells hitting the sunlight, you know, the, the brass, the brass coming out of the, the receiver who you know, in court testimony, he said he was just pretending he was firing the 45. I mean, come on. The visual evidence, however, is inconclusive. Pryor himself always insisted he never fired his sidearm. I don't think he fired at all. He'd been around a long time, and he's the last guy in the world I could picture ever doing that. The other potential shooter was this man, a freelance photographer and alleged FBI informant, Terry Norman. Norman was involved in one of the most bizarre moments of the day. Joe Butano and his cameraman, George Gomez, were in the right place at the right time to capture it. Here, a graduate student named Harold Reed can be seen chasing Terry Norman towards the safety of the National Guard lines. Camera and sound are rolling as Norman takes out a handgun and gives it to a police officer, who will later give it to KSU police detective Tom Kelly. That's how to kill me. Yeah, yeah. No doubt. The guy, that's how beat me up, man. Try to drag guy. My camera hit me in the face. 
Tom Kelly asked for the gun, and that's when he opened it up and he said there's four shots fired. Now, I saw the empty cases, but George was shooting something else. Unfortunately, cameraman George Gomez had moved away, and this crucial exchange was not captured on film. In his official statement, Kelly claimed the gun had not been fired. But Joe Butano still says otherwise. Tom Kelly told us the gun was fired. And according to Butano, Terry Norman confirmed it. We had asked him then, Terry, did you, why did you fire your gun? And he says, I had to. They were beating on me. And I says, you did shoot it four times then. He says, yes, I did. Butano's account has been corroborated by at least one other person. But a presidential commission on campus unrest concluded that the guardsmen were the only ones to have fired a weapon. When this program contacted Norman for an interview, he refused. Still, the central question remains. Was there an official order to fire? Did anyone order them to fire, or did they just start shooting? They were not ordered to fire. Each soldier fired when he thought that his life was in danger. I believe it's perfectly normal for a man to have the right to protect his own life. There are not hordes of students ready to overrun the National Guard uh, who ultimately settled on that as one of their, as their reason for shooting. I mean, my God, the closest student that was making any kind of gesture toward them was Joseph Lewis, who was standing there uh, giving them the finger. I know that there was no reason for them to shoot me. I was silent and I was motionless. I was standing still and there was no way they were under any threat from the students present. The chaotic aftermath can be seen in this rare home movie film. Joe Butano says it was given to his crew on the day of the shooting by an unknown student. In the midst of the commotion, the guardsmen formed up and were redeployed at the edge of the commons. Stay back here. Guys weren't talking. We weren't talking. I think we were stunned at what did happen, what some of us saw. But shock would soon turn to anger on both sides. Students enraged over the shootings defiantly reassembled in the commons. The National Guard commander, General Robert Canterbury, was not going to let that happen. He was determined to clear the area. May 4th, 1970. Just minutes after 13 students at Kent State University were shot by members of the Ohio National Guard. The field known as the Commons again separates the two sides. The guard now standing by the burned out ROTC building. The students assembling on a slope near the Freedom Bell. There was horror and there was sadness, but there was a feeling of revenge there that surfaced. The guard, led by General Robert Canterbury, prepares to disperse the students a second time, despite the violence that has just erupted. Here, Canterbury is confronted by a Kent State professor. Well, listen, you've got to stop this. This is turning into a slaughter. Well, you seem to be unmoved by it. It's a terrible thing. These are, high, these are college kids. Look, this is a problem. Listen, I, and I was in the military. I don't know about this killing stuff. Canterbury, in general, was an aggressive guy. If he weren't, he wouldn't have been there uh, out on the hill. That's not typical. Another professor, Glenn Frank, makes one final effort to defuse the situation. They will not, will not make any trouble. You can... We have no option. No. Sir, you've got a couple hundred students there who might get hurt. Are you, are you all can right? we try to move them out first? Can we try to move them out? Will you give us a chance? How long will you give us? Soon after, Frank uses a bullhorn to address the crowd. Please listen to me right now. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. I am begging you right now. If you don't disperse right now, they're going to move in, and it can only be a slaughter. 
Jesus Christ, I don't want to be a part of this. Please, Please. I'm begging you also, follow me off this way. Glenn Frank made us realize that it was a bad situation, that if we didn't leave, that we might be shot. Reluctantly, the students leave the commons. Further catastrophe is averted. By order of President White, the university campus has been closed. By the next day, the campus was all but deserted. But the storm surrounding Kent State was just beginning. The shooting threatened to split the country in half. Many felt the students deserved what they got. I was sitting at the kitchen table, and my father came in the back door. And he looked across the room and saw me sitting there. And with his hand still on the doorknob, he says to me, um, they should have shot all of them. And I said to him, well, don't you know then that one of those people would have been me? And he just walked into his office in the back, which was down the back hall. Didn't say anything else. On the other side of the political spectrum, the outrage over the shootings inspired more protests across the country. What it did was bring the nation's attention to how our youth had fallen into the line of fire. That somehow uh, we'd gotten to such an extreme point that angry youth were an enemy category. That very attitude nearly paid off for Governor Rhodes. On the day of the shootings, he was trailing his opponent in the Republican Senate race by seven points. He lost the next day's primary, but only by a single point. Rhodes never voiced any regrets about sending the National Guard to Kent State, and most of Ohio's voters apparently never blamed him for the tragedy. After a four-year hiatus due to term limits, he would be elected governor again in 1974 and 1978. It seemed that Rhodes knew his constituency. Promoting law and order worked. And perhaps that was the problem. This was not good law enforcement. This was politics. They handled it in more of a political way than a law enforcement way. That's why it happened. Because of his injuries, Dean Kaler will be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. The four students who died are memorialized where they fell. And each year, a candlelight vigil is held on the Kent State campus. It is a poignant reminder of the lives lost and the scars that remain. Nothing that took place on the campus between May 1st and May 4th necessitated the use of lethal violence against unarmed civilians. I can say this as a participant and less as a historian. It's a sickening feeling to lie there prone, having been shot already, and to have gunshots going off over your head, not having any idea how long that gunfire is going to last and have no way of defending yourself. The fundamental role of a democracy is to control the amount of police force that's used. And uh, what happened was a inappropriate and very unf unfair uh, use of force against uh, protesting students. Eight of the National Guardsmen, including Matthew McManus, were later indicted for violating the students' civil rights. None of those charged were officers. The accused soldiers were ultimately acquitted in both criminal and civil court. Still, for Matthew McManus, the situation was inexcusable. In the end, it was emotions, I believe, that took command. I want people to, to know in their heart of hearts that, that the guardsmen suffered, not as much as some, but we've suffered, and that we're deeply regretful of what took place.
we may never know exactly what prompted the National Guard to open fire at Kent State. After so many years, a definitive answer could not, of course, bring back the dead.